This is the last thylacine. He died almost 90 years ago in a Hobart Zoo. And this is the preserved body of a thylacine joey. Tissue from this specimen has yielded an almost complete genome for the species. It forms the basis for a project seeking to bring the thylacine back from the dead. To many, this is an immensely exciting prospect and a noble cause. Others have strong reservations and some object outright. What are the arguments for and against? Should we bring the thylacine back? Keep watching if you haven't already decided. The following might help you make up your mind. And if you have made up your mind, maybe it will lead you to change it. Hi, I'm Professor Steve Rowe. I'm a real paleontologist, and you're watching Real Paleontology. And today, we're talking de-extinction, specifically the de-extinction of an iconic species, the thylacine, aka the Tasmanian tiger. Now up front, as I pointed out in the last episode here, where we looked into how the thylacine actually lived, this is a species close to my heart. I began my scientific career studying it and its marsupial carnivore relatives for my PhD over 30 years ago. I've maintained a very strong interest in it ever since. So at one level, I figure I can speak with at least some authority on the question at hand. That said, I have no expertise in the field of molecular biology, which is what you need if you want to go around de-extincting stuff. I guess too, you could argue that my personal interest in this animal might predispose me to bias, one way or the other. However, I'm going to try my damnedest to objectively present the arguments for and against. I'm also going to make this brief. It won't be a comprehensive treatment, just a heads up on what the arguments actually are. At the end, I will give you my personal opinion on this and my reasons for it. So, first up, what even is the Thylacine De-Extinction Project? Who's running it? What are its objectives? And who is backing it? Well, spearheading the project is Professor Andrew Parsky, working out of the University of Melbourne with a team of nine scientists. This is the Thylacine Integrated Genetic Restoration Research Laboratory, TIGA for short. At this point, the project has been funded by an anonymous private donor to the tune of at least $3.6 million US. It's also backed by Colossal Biosciences Incorporated, founded in 2021 by George Church and Ben Lamb, and de-extinction is their game. This is a serious company. It has evidently attracted around $435 million US in private funding. Their headline projects are de-extinction of the woolly mammoth, the dodo, and the thylacine. However, Colossal Biosciences has not yet publicly disclosed how much money they're putting into the thylacine project. So, where are we at? And what's the plan? Well, as of now, early March 2025, the Tigger Lab has retrieved over 99% of the thylacine genome. They hope to have viable thylacine-like embryos within the next three to four years, actual live births and controlled breeding by 2033, and reintroduction of thylacines, presumably into national parks, by 2040. Although no clear commitments by relevant authorities have been made at this time, and I should note that most experts in the field of molecular biology consider this to be a very optimistic timeline. So let's start with the arguments for de-extinction. Number one, moral responsibility. This is simple. Humans undeniably drove the thylacine to extinction. Therefore, if we can bring it back, then we darn well should. Number two, reversing the impacts of trophic downgrading. This is not so simple, and I'll spend a bit more time on this one. So what the hell is trophic downgrading, you might ask? Basically, if you eliminate an apex predator from an ecosystem, you can, and almost certainly will, kick off a chain reaction with all sorts of unpredictable, wide-ranging impacts that can transform entire landscapes. 
The classic example of this is the eradication of grey wolves from Yellowstone National Park, which happened by 1926. The result was an explosion in the populations of large herbivores and the next largest mammalian predator, the coyote. The knock-on effects of this were wide-scale deforestation and increased pressure on the smaller species that coyotes typically prey on. Deforestation in itself, of course, had all sorts of further repercussions, a massive reduction of beavers for one, which then of course leads to all sorts of other impacts and so on and so forth. The reintroduction of wolves in 1995 has gone a long way toward restoring this balance by driving down numbers of large herbivores and coyotes. In Australia, a broadly comparable project is now underway with the recent release of 11 Tasmanian devils into a wildlife refuge on the Australian mainland. Devils disappeared from the mainland around 3,000 years ago and their surviving populations in Tasmania are under threat from a terrible facial tumour disease. It's hoped that reintroducing the devil more broadly on the mainland will help to restore balance in ecosystems by suppressing populations of two feral predators that have had devastating impacts on native species, the fox and feral cat. I for one think that this is an absolutely splendid idea. In fact, back in 2003, I wrote this paper in Nature Australia calling for reintroduction of the devil to the mainland for this very reason. I also point out that Mina Jones and Friends published this paper in 2020, clearly demonstrating that in Tasmania, devils really do suppress feral cat numbers and take pressure off our beloved native marsupials, such as our cute little bandicoots. The other obvious benefit of this reintroduction project is that it provides insurance against the awful possibility that this horrendous facial tumour disease drives devils in Tasmania to extinction. The project is run by a very dedicated guy called Tim Faulkner and supported by big celebs like Aussie legend Chris Hemsworth. So hey, it's got to be good. I obviously reckon this is a very worthwhile cause and if you'd like to donate to it as I have, here is a link. Number three, cultural and economic benefits. The de-extinction and rewilding of the thylacine could significantly boost the Tasmanian economy. Now, I've got to say that personally, despite any reservations I might have about the process, I, for one, could not but help visit Tasmania to catch even a glimpse of a thylacine. Number four, there can be little doubt that there will be spin-offs from this work in the fields of gene editing and cloning. These could be of considerable assistance in the protection of currently endangered species. Some might be of broader use in the biomedical fields as well, provided that they're publicly shared, of course. Certainly to date, the Tiger Lab has already shared the Tasmanian tiger's genome and Colossal Biosciences maintains that it will publicly share new technologies developed. Now for the arguments against the extinction and rewilding of the thylacine. Will the knowledge that we can always resurrect a species we drive to extinction make a small cavalier less concerned about wiping species out? Basically, if we know we can bring back any species we want, whenever we want, then some people may be more likely to take risks regarding the treatment of endangered species. The zombie species concern. No matter the exact procedure applied in de-extinction, the result will be a hybrid species that is not 100% identical to the original. Even if it's 99% original or more, even a tiny fractional difference could result in significant morphological or behavioural differences. Tied to this are other ethical concerns. Gene editing experiments might have high failure rates and result in real pain and suffering for the thylacine hybrids produced. Point three, where are they going to be released and under what circumstances will this be on private or public land? Who will administer it? Who will cover any ongoing costs? None of this has been finalised. Moreover, obviously, the first thylacines will have no parents to teach them how to be a thylacine, how to hunt, how to exist in the wild. 
Number four, the reintroduction of apex predators certainly can have a beneficial effect, as demonstrated by the reintroduction of wolves to Yellowstone, but the fact that it can does not mean that it will. It's simply impossible to reliably predict the impact on other species with certainty. We know very little about the ecology of the thylacine. An obvious question is, how might the reintroduction of the thylacine impact on the Tasmanian devil, which, as I said, is under serious threat from facial tumour disease? Okay, so that's my very brief summation of the pros and cons. I hope that you, the viewer, might like to delve into these more thoroughly and develop your own well-informed opinion and join what I hope will be a lively but respectful debate in the comment section below. And I'll try and kick this off by giving you my opinion. But before I do, if you found this little presentation useful, can I please ask that you like and subscribe? That means a lot. So, what do I reckon? Well, as I implied up front, I don't think many people would be more excited than me at the prospect of seeing a real live thylacine. That said, I am truly conflicted on this. Although I do believe that all of the arguments levelled for the extinction and rewilding of the thylacine have merit, so do some of those against. Before I began my own little deep dive into this, I think my three greatest concerns were the same three that seem to be most commonly raised. Secondly, that it's simply impossible to accurately predict the broad-ranging consequences of introducing any species, even if it is a species that was previously present. And it should be noted that around 12 species of terrestrial mammal, reptile and amphibian are currently listed as endangered or vulnerable by the Tasmanian Department of Natural Resources and Environment. There are many more bird species. And finally, the possibility that this could lead to genuine suffering for the surrogates and first-generation thylacine hybrids. On the first of these concerns, I'm in no doubt that the great majority of the money involved has been privately sourced. To me, this makes the argument that the money might be better spent elsewhere a moot point. There's no evidence that these private donations would have otherwise gone to other conservation efforts. In short, if the project was taxpayer funded, I personally would be against it, but it's not. Regarding the second, the fact that we can't confidently predict the potentially cascading effects of reintroduction, here it needs to be pointed out that the same concerns can be levelled at reintroduction of the Tasmanian devil on the Australian mainland. The project is, of course, as I said, already underway. We'll learn from this and provided that reintroduction of the thylacine is carefully monitored and controlled, I think the risks are very slight. Don't forget we're looking at a large mammalian hypercarnivore here. We're not playing with a species that has the potential to rapidly explode in population size. Even under ideal circumstances, big, warm-blooded apex predators like the Tasmanian tiger can only ever exist in low population densities, making them much easier to control than introduced species like the rabbit or cane toad, two species that have wrought havoc on many Australian landscapes. The third concern that these experiments may result in genuine suffering for the animals involved is to me the most difficult. And I would really like to see the results of independent assessment and oversight here. That off my chest, my final thoughts on this are I really think that this is going to happen sooner or later, like it or not, maybe in 10 years, maybe in 50. Pretty much the only thing that would put a spanner in the works here is direct government intervention to shut it down. And I think that's unlikely. In short, I reckon that debate over whether or not it should happen is kind of redundant. To those of us who have concerns, I think we really need to lobby for complete transparency and at least some independent oversight. So folks, that's my two cents worth. But I'm absolutely sure that there are different opinions out there and I repeat, I'm somewhat conflicted and very open to new information that might support or detract from arguments for or against. So please, fire away in the comments section below. I look forward 
to constructive debate.